Hello, and welcome to uh, Wise as Serpent broadcast with uh, Ralph Ellis and Dr. Robert M. Price. And Dr. Uh, Ralph Ellis is here to, uh, Professor Ellis, we'll call him, is here to uh, answer all your questions. Uh, you can call in. Uh, lines are open at 434-532-9370. And uh, we'll put you online with Ralph Ellis. Um, let's see. We've got a comment over here. Craftomatic. Wish I could participate. I'm a huge fan of Ralph Ellis. I have to work my side hustle job, Lisa. Oh, that's terrible. Mm. All right. We got Carl Karn Snark. Are you in, are you here, Carl? All right, brother. Uh oh. Hit the wrong button. All right. No. How's everybody been doing out there? Okay. How you been doing? Oh uh, yeah, we're uh yeah, very well. Thank you. Thanks for having us back on again. Uh, I'm Abbot uh, Ellis today. I've decided to uh, oh, an abbot. be in charge of a monastery. There we go. So I'm, I'm mm. Abbot today is my preferred pronoun. And I hope everybody <laughs> uses it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's cool. It, what it is, is, let's see here. We got, oh, Dr. Bob and Ralph. All right, Carl. Get, I was going... You say Admiral Ellis, laugh out loud. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's put it up here on the ship. There we go. I, I'll do that next time. Next time I'll be Admiral, maybe. <laughs> All right, well, the air staff, perhaps. We have we have a few people coming in. Um, anyone who wants to call in, feel free. Four three four. It's in the United States. Five three two nine three seven zero. All right. Um, the topic of conversation, whatever you want right now. And Ralph, uh, uh, would be good if you talked about, didn't you write a book about Thoth? Thoth? Mm, I did. Uh, what, one of my first books was uh, on the pyramids and the megaliths. So that was mm. one of my early interests. Mm. So I wrote a, a book about that, which was um, novel, you might say. It was all very interesting and new. Uh, lots of new information that doesn't seem to have been broadcast very much before i mean little things like um uh, the egyptians used the same uh, metrological system as the imperial system which is still in use in america today so uh the great pyramid measures 1760 cubits around the base which is a uh, royal pyramid mile um but of course the imperial mile is 1,760 yards. So the mile being used in America today is exactly the same as the mile that was used in ancient uh, Egypt to create the pyramids. So <laughs> little things like that are very interesting. They are. Mm. Um, and the reason it um, was, was designed like that is, is because it was based upon pi. So the mm. fractional equivalent of pi is 22 over 7. And so the whole of that system is based on the number 22. Mm. And the uh, pyramid circumference, and therefore the imperial mile, um, was a 40 times copy of pi. Mm. And, well, that's why we get all of these um, uh, mentions of number 40 within the uh, gospel, within the... Old Testament and the Gospels. So, you know, the 40 years in the wilderness and the 40 days and nights in the wilderness, the 40 years of uh, David and Solomon's and so on. All of these mentions of the number 40 are indications of being initiated into the, the secrets and the metrology of the Giza Plateau. Um, because the Great Pyramid was a 40 times copy of Pi. And so people understood that. And people who had been initiated into this sort of pseudo-Masonic um, cult, as it were, would understand that. And if you put the number 40 into your biography, then it showed that you had been initiated. Um, Kirk, so, Kirk, yeah, there's, there's lots of evidence that indicates... Because I don't know if Bob, Bob has heard this from me before, but um, 
uh, the, 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 there's a big secret in the um, Old Testament in that the Israelites have managed to lose their sacred mountain. Mm. Now, how on earth did they manage to do that? You know, these are people who wrote about and recorded everything that happened. So how on earth did they lose Mount Sinai? Well, they didn't. They just don't want you to know where it is. Um, and we can find out where it is by just the descriptions of it. So um, it was on the edge of a desert. It was the largest mountain in the region. Um, but it was small enough that you could cordon it off because you weren't allowed to touch it. In fact, I, the, the penalty for touching Mount Sinai was death. Uh, it was one of the few um, reasons you could uh, get a death sentence. Um, hmm. It was sharp and difficult to climb. It had a cave inside it where God lived. And at the bottom of Mount Sinai, there was a pavement that was dark and black and looked like the night sky. So where is this sacred mountain? Well, it's the Great Pyramid, of course, because the Great Pyramid is on the edge of a desert. It's the largest mountain in the region, um, but it's small enough that you can cordon it off. It's sharp and it's difficult to climb. And it's got a cave inside it, which was always open. We know that because Strabo says so. Um, and at the bottom of the Great Pyramid, you've got the black basalt pavement. Mm -hmm. The description is exactly the same. And of course, the Giza pyramids were not tombs. They were a religious site. They were a temple site. These were temples, not strictly speaking to the gods, but temples to the cosmos because they embodied mathematics. They embodied um, the old adage of as above, so below. They reflected the uh, stars in the heavens above and they pointed to the stars using their causeways. So all of those causeways were designed uh, to reflect a certain date during the year. So the, the Great and Second Pyramids, they have causeways that are pointing out at the cross quarter, which is one month displaced from the um, spring equinox. Um, so, yeah, these, these enormous great temples were dedicated to the uh, cosmos. And, Here's, um, a, yeah, we got a do question. we have any questions there? Uh, yeah, we got one here. Um, it just came through on Twitter. It says, Ralph, would you please talk about the Steely of Santorini eruption around the uh, time? Oh, yes. Yeah, but that, that's, um, that's what he wants to know. That's the, that's the Tempest Stella, they call it. So this is a Stella from uh, Pharaoh Armosi I, um, who was a Theban Pharaoh at the time of the eruption of Santorini. And that is quite interesting. I could, uh, I could go on quite some time about this because, <laughs> because this is a... Um, an Egyptian record of the plagues of Egypt. Mm. So we have two versions. Obviously, we have the plagues of Egypt in, in uh, Exodus, but the Tempest Stella is remarkably similar. <laughs> so the Tempest Stella was written in about 1580 odd, uh, BC, just after the uh, Santorini eruption. And of course, the Santorini eruption was the largest eruption in the Mediterranean basin in living memory. Um, sorry, not living memory, in recorded uh, history, should I say. Um, so it affected all of the nations around the Mediterranean basin, and it affected Egypt. And so it mentions the fact that there was darkness for a number of days. There were storms. Um, there was huge disruption within Egypt. Um, so it's recording very much the same as the plagues. And of course, that we know that the plagues were something to do with the Exodus event because the Exodus event records um, a pillar of fire, a pillar of smoke. That's obviously the volcano. Um, darkness for three days, which there would have been after the eruption. A great ash fall 
Remember, Moses says, um, God said unto Moses, take you handfuls of ash from the hearth of a fire and cast them up into the sky and it will become a small dust over the whole land of Egypt. That is a perfect description of the long range fallout uh, from the eruption of Santorini. Santorini being just north of Crete, of course, um, the island north of Crete. And then, of course, we have the parting of the waters. Now, the parting of the waters wasn't in the Red Sea, of course, that's not what it says. It says in the um, Yamsuf, which is the uh, Reed Sea. Um, and it's quite obviously, it was a tsunami. And that's exactly what would happen in a tsunami. The sea just disappears. You wouldn't, in a, a, a shallow sloping uh, delta land, like in uh, sort of northern Egypt, the sea would go out for miles. You, you wouldn't be able to see the sea. All you would see is sand and a few fish flopping up and down on the sand. Now, one group got caught out by it. The other didn't. Why the difference? Well, because the, um, the, this was a part of the Hyksos exodus, of course, the uh, Hyksos pharaohs out of Egypt. The Hyksos lived in the Delta land. They would have seen tsunamis there fairly regularly because Santorini had been huffing and puffing for maybe more than a year. So they would have seen small tsunamis where the sea disappeared and then came back again, back in again. They would have known the dangers of a tsunami. But the Egyptian army, and by Egyptian I mean the southern Egyptian army of Amosi the I, they had never even seen the sea, let alone see a seen a tsunami. Oh. And so when the sea disappeared out, their soldiers thought, well, this is very odd, and walked out across the uh, beach, catching their fish for breakfast, because all the fish were just sitting there flopping in the sand, and then the tsunami rushes back in again, just like oh. it did on the Indonesian tsunami, where all of those tourists who, again, didn't know what was going on, and they were walking down the beach because the sea had disappeared, but then the sea rolled back in again and they were all killed. It's exactly yeah, part, what would happen. Excuse me a second. Do you have any, mm -hmm. um, they keep asking for um, visuals. <laughs> this person um, has like yes, four times I, asking visuals. Yeah, well, visuals. I've, I've got, um, let me have a look. I've, I've got some <laughs> images that we might be able to have a look at. So uh, let's have a look. Where have we got? She says, hello, this is Angie from Amsterdam. Hello, Angie. How are we? <laughs> um, I'm just wondering which one it will be on. Joseph. No, not on Joseph. Oh, Desmond. I've never heard anyone use that visuals. That was pretty. Yeah. Uh, well, quite often I, I show images, of course. Um, so um, I do do that. Um, it's just a matter right. of picking them up because um, I don't always know where I've stored them that much. Because I got so many images, you can imagine. Carolina Bays, no, it's not going to be that. Arthur, no, not King Arthur. Pyramids, no. No, I can't uh, find any just very quickly there. I'll keep on looking, see if I can find anything. Oh, Santorini, how about that? That sounds like a promising... <laughs> <laughs> file doesn't it so yeah, uh there. okay let's have a look at that uh so if i do a quick screen share so where's uh settings no present screen share uh i want a window that one and open that one that now you should be coming up with an image of um akhenaten which is not exactly what you're looking for but there we go um, but if I run down, this comes down from my uh, book, Tempest and Exodus. It's about the Tempestella of Amosi the First, of course. 
um, which is a real Egyptian artifact. Obviously, you know, it's a real stella. And here we go. I mean, <clears throat> this is not Santorini, obviously, because they they didn't have um, cameras back in those days. But anyway, this is um, a more recent eruption. You can see what they mean by a pillar of smoke yeah. and a pillar of fire. And it's quite yeah. obvious what they were talking about um, was something to do with a um, volcanic eruption. And of course, we did have one at the time of the Tempest Stella when it was made circa 1580 BC. Now this, um, this tsunami would have run out from here. Can you see my cursor running around? You can, yes. 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 Um, that's Santorini, just north of Crete. Now, this was a subduction uh, eruption. So okay. the uh, just to give you the, the rationale behind these uh, eruptions, you get this big magna, magma chamber underneath the island, which grows mm -hmm. and grows with more pressure. So the island actually grows and rises out of the sea. It gets bigger and bigger. <clears throat> and then it starts to huff and puff. So you get lots of eruptions with uh, cloud and ash and so on. And this can carry... You, your seat is squeaking there. Um, <laughs> this can carry on for uh, a year or more. So uh, like some of the more recent ones, even Mount St. St. Helens was huffing and puffing for quite some time. They knew something was going on. And all the time it's releasing pressure, releasing pressure. And this carries on and on and on until the magma chamber runs out of energy. It runs out of magma. And then the whole of the island collapses into the sea. So you get this one final big uh, cataclysm. And of course, that's a subduction uh, event. And so the, um, the sea rushes in to that cavity. And therefore, when the tsunami runs out across the Mediterranean, it runs as a, um, a subduction first. So the sea runs out before it comes back in again. And you can see all the red lines here are the um, tsunami as it runs out across wow. the Mediterranean. Now, these were calculated by some sort of computer program that they had put in. So um, this is what they estimate the um, front of the tsunami would look like as it ran across the Mediterranean. Mm. And when it got to the Nile Delta, it would do this. So this is the Ind Indonesian tsunami and the sea has disappeared. You can see the tourists wondering what on earth's going on. The sea has just vanished. Um, what they don't realize is that big line of white water on the horizon, that's the sea coming back in again. Hmm. So these tourists on this beach here, they've only got five minutes to live. They will be dead in five minutes. Um, hmm. And that's exactly what happened to the Egyptian army. The Egyptian army, in my view, this was a big tsunami and they ran out across the, the uh, seabed, A, because they were uh, amazed, B, because there was free fish to, to catch and they got caught out by the tsunami. And that was the wall of water that is mentioned in the, um, uh, in, in the book of Exodus. Now, <clears throat> this demonstrates that this must have been a real event because the exodus has recorded five black swan events now a black swan event nobody could ever invent it nobody could ever dream of it because it's so absurd <laughs> and therefore how can anyone ha have written about it but the exodus account has five five black swans that are all connected with a maritime volcano there's the uh, pillar of smoke, pillar of, sm uh, of uh, fire. There's the ash fall. There's the darkness for three days um, and the great tsunami. Now, how would an ancient chronicler have known that all of those aspects are connected with a maritime volcano if they had not been there and witnessed it? This must no. have been an eyewitness account. 
otherwise they wouldn't have been able to write it and that's exactly what they did so it's quite obvious that the exodus event is based on um historical accounts of the um eruption of uh, santorini and and just going back to the um tempestella it's interesting in another respect in that it records the civil war between the southern egyptians and the northern egyptians between Armosi the first and the pharaoh of the hyksos pharaohs of egypt and remember the hyksos pharaohs were known as shepherds um, just as the um, old testament patriarchs were called shepherds um, but as a part of those ne negotiations in this civil war between these two parties um, Armosi the first says that he gave the Hyksos, um, gold and silver and cloth and oil in order for them to leave Egypt. And of course, in the Exodus account, the Israelites received exactly the same um, tributes. Well, they call it tribute. It was an incentive for them to leave on the Exodus. Now, the the, the Exodus account has exactly the same thing. Moses received from Pharaoh all of these items to go induce them to leave Egypt. So the Tempestella reads as the book of Exodus, but written from the al alternate perspective, from the perspective of the southern Egyptians, not the northern Egyptians. So we've got two records of the Exodus. One is the book of Exodus and the other is the Tempestella. It's um, more or less exactly the same. Um, so that, w that was what I was writing about in my book, uh, Tempest and Exodus. Um, mm, so, wow. Yeah, it was an interesting little story. Oh, and the other thing, of course, is after the uh, Exodus happened, <coughs> this is the Exodus of the Hyksos people. It was the Hyksos who destroyed Jericho. Hmm. Jericho was destroyed at the end of the um, uh, Middle Bronze Age, circa about 1570 BC, which was the exact time of the Hyksos exodus out of Egypt. Hmm. Um, so yeah. again, the, the exodus story is correct because it records that they destroyed Jericho. And hmm. that's exactly what the Hyksos did. Wow. We have uh, several questions from uh, mm, Sorry, Twitter. I was a bit long on that one, but I uh, thought uh, I'd go to town on that one. So. Oh, no problem. Let's see what let's see what Carl has to say. Put him on the screen here. Sin, sin, moon, Sinai of the moon. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah. Um, uh, Carl likes to, I think, involve a lot of uh, influence from Parthia. Now, I don't think the Parthia... Uh, influence is that great. Um, if anything, the Great Pyramid would have been the Pyramid of the Sun and the Second Pyramid would have been in the Pyramid of the Moon, of course, because they're almost made in the right proportions. Remember, the Sun, um, as we see it in the sky, is very slightly larger than the Moon. And, of course, the Great Pyramid is very slightly bigger than the uh, Second Pyramid. So, if anything, the second pyramid would have been um, the pyramid of the moon. I'm not sure if um, Sin would have been um, the rationale behind that name. Um, in the Aramaic, because I, I tend to go back to the Aramaic or the Egyptian, because the Egyptian... Uh, here's, here's another thing which uh, I, I don't know if Bob has heard this. It might uh, shock him a little bit. Um, Aramaic is a daughter language of Egyptian. Hmm. They are the same. Hmm. Wow. Um, it, I, I have a, a book here somewhere which is um, 200. Uh, now, this is funny because the book says 200 Aramaic works, words in ancient Egyptian. But of course, that's the wrong way round. Who was the um, dominant country here with the dominant language? It would have been the Egyptians. It, the book should be 200 Egyptian words in Aramaic, hmm. not the other way round. Wow. Um, and if, if you read the um, dictionary, 
Um, I like this one best, which is uh, Wallace Budge. Uh -huh. And it's a two-volume dictionary, two volumes, of hieroglyphs. And all the way through it, you, me? you will see this word in Egyptian was derived from the Coptic or from the Aramaic. Now, by derived, they mean that's how they translated the words. Because obviously they didn't know the Egyptian language. How do you find out what these words mean? Well, they go hunting through the Coptic language and Aramaic to find out which what words they were talking about. And so time and time again, um, as you sort of go through it, you'll see um, just one page at random. Um, and this is par, par bar and they have the Aramaic equivalent. C bar. OK, so it doesn't say what it means on that one. Let's find another one because, um, I mean, these are so frequent, it's, it's untrue. So as I look through it, you're going to say, oh, you can't find it now, can you? <laughs> Wasn't parbar um, a word in the Hebrew Bible that nobody knew what it meant, uh, perhaps until recently? I forget if they finally found it, but it wasn't used in any uh, meaningful context that would reveal what it meant. Uh, and so yeah, it says that's, it hmm. that's, that's, that often happens because, of course, they lost Aramaic as well, and mm. they had to revive Aramaic a lot through... Um, through the Arabic, which has you know great sim similarities, mm -hmm. so here's here's a word, uh, umt, but this one is um, Coptic instead of um, instead of Aramaic, and then the word below that is um, umt, which also means tower or citadel, and again <laughs> they've um, translated that from the Aramaic, uh, sorry, wow. from the uh, Coptic. Um, <laughs> So, um, but it's not surprising. Um, Joseph was the prime minister of Egypt. Mm. What language did he speak? He would have spoken fluent ancient Egyptian. Otherwise, he could not have been the prime minister of Egypt. Same as Moses. Moses was a, an army commander, um, the chief army commander, according to uh, Josephus, of the Egyptian army. What language did he speak? He spoke Egyptian. Um, and so, yeah, the, the foundation of Aramaic was, was quite obviously um, quite, of, oh, it is, um, quite obviously Egyptian. Here's one that uh, Bob will know, of course. Um, this is ale, which um, in, actually it's in Assyrian as well, Assyrian and in Aramaic, is a horned animal and of course <laughs> you, you'll know that one ale yeah you, 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 i recognize that one as well um because i think it's used uh, to mean sheep quite often isn't it ale if i remember correctly so um yeah that was a bit of a a, a diversion but uh, yes mm, interesting the, um Let's see. Um, let's see if we can put some people up here. Let them. Okay. Let's go here. Cynthia, Greek, Armidus, who was born on Mount Scythius. Carl Carsonic. If you want to comment on that, that's uh Cynthia, Greek, Artemis, who, sorry, I missed that. Artemis, who was born on Mount Scythius. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, not sure what the question is. Okay. Here we go. Lots of magic mountains in that part of the world. Even Muhammad moved a mountain. Yeah, okay. well, they had um, quite a fascination um, with with mountains, of course. Um, if we uh, look around, I might even have some images of these uh, magic mountains. Um, you want me to put it? Let's see if I can uh, get, get that back up. You want me to get the... The screen share back up. Yeah, let me have a quick look for um, um because I think I know. 
which file that's in. Yeah, I'm just choosing uh, a, a file for it. Okay. I want um, Zodiac, no. It, um, Elegabal and Grailstone. Wow, this is uh, interesting. I didn't know that. Um, it, my sages. It says, uh, one thing here, I didn't know this. It said, Ralph proposed a theory about the location of the tombs of the King Solomon and Queen of Sheba. He suggested they're in Egypt. Yeah. It, um, that's interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we, we can quickly talk about that because, um, I'm just trying to uh, think. Um, yeah, my um, thesis on that, which is a whole book, is is called um, Solomon the Pharaoh of Egypt. And it's based on the fact that there are many similarities between the United Monarchy and... Um, the 21st dynasty of Egypt. So uh, what I what I tried to do, um, because obviously we there's a problem with with Solomon and David in that they um, uh, they cannot be found in the historical record. So if you read you know the archaeology of uh, uh, of uh, Jerusalem by uh, Finkelstein and and Silberman, they say that Jerusalem was uh, no more than a village in the uh, 10th century. So there was no great united monarchy. It just simply did not exist. And that's always been a problem um, for Judaism. And um, how do you uh, overcome that? Well, I went looking for <laughs> the united monarchy in Egypt because everything seems to be linked with Egypt somehow. Mm. And I found all of these um, major similarities between the 21st dynasty and the uh, ancestors of um, uh, King David and Solomon. So, I mean, just some of them here, you've got um, from, th these are the ancestors of David and Solomon. So you've got Aminabdab. Now in the 21st, 20, 20th dynasty and 21st dynasty, you get Amin Nazbanebjet. Aminabdab, mm. Amin Nazbanebjet. So if you cut out the middle bit, you get Amen Nebjed, Amen Nabdab. Then the next one is Nashon. And of course, in the uh, Egyptian record, you get Amenem Neshu. <laughs> Nashon, Neshu. It's the same. <laughs> um, then you get Salmon, again, another ancestor of David. And in the Egyptian record, you get Siamun. Salmon, Siamun. Uh, and then you get Boaz. The famous Boaz, one of the pillars, and uh, in Egypt he's uh, ba um, Bas Uas Orkon. So Uas Orkon, Boaz, Bas Uas, and then mm. uh, you get Obed, and in Egypt you get Amenem Opet, mm. Obed Opet, and then we end up with David and Solomon, of course. And then so I obviously started looking at the um, family of uh, King David and you get the same sort of similarities. So King David is known for his star in his city. Well, the first pharaoh of the 21st dynasty is um, Pasiba Kahayanit, which means my star rises in my city. Oh. And every brick in the city had the star and city on it. He was known for his star and his city. And then you find that um, the someone's dialing in there. Go ahead. Your phone is going. That's Hello? Better. Um, hey. hey, what's up? Not much. Hey. You're doing a show right now? Yeah. Hello, you're, you're on your telephone. I'll put you on, man. Ask Ralph. I mean, you, you wanted to call and ask Ralph a question. What's he talking about? The Egyptian pharaohs, remember? 
Oh, the Egyptian yeah. pharaohs. Okay, so we, how we about, can all hear uh, your telephone call. Do you, you want know, to meet is yourself? Is there any? Uh, I have. Is, is, Hello. Is there any evidence um, <clears throat> that the tefillin, the phylacteries, you know, what are they really, and and where did they come from? Did they come from Egypt, right? Uh, yeah, here, I'm going to put you on with them. Say hello to Ralph Ellis and Dr. Price, all right? Hello. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. We have Hi. a caller. Yeah, go yeah, ahead, I haven't, I haven't finished the previous explanation yet. I'm Jeff. sorry. I'm sorry. Well, hang on. All righty. Um, yeah, so, so um, yeah, coordination. Yeah, yeah he's, he's doing an explanation. I didn't mean to bother him. I'm, uh, What's terrible. he explaining I'm, right now? What I should tune in, huh? You're, you're, still, yeah. you're, you're still on... Uh, we can still yeah. hear you. You want to meet, meet yourself? I just been working on my resume this morning. I'm doing laundry right now. Hold on, but... Charles Ann. Are, are you ready? You're still on radio. Hello. Oh, sorry. Do you want to mute? <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you, you. I'm sorry. This thing is. Uh, hold on. Go ahead. Okay. Are right, you ready? No. No. Hold not on. yet. No, of course not. This is <laughs> technical difficulties. All right. I'm having terrible technical difficulties here. Can you hear me? All okay. Right. Ralph, I'm sorry about that. This is just go ahead. Go ahead with your question um, real quick to him. Okay. No, I'm right, going to continue. Uh, oh. I'm sorry. It's, it's uh, just uncoordinated. We'll get it together. The communication. Um, I'll, I'll put him on hold for just a second so you can finish your explanation, Ralph. Sorry, sir. Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah, so we have these links between the United Monarchy and the uh, 21st Dynasty of uh, Egypt. No, I don't think so. Are we on air? Hello? You're still not oh. muted. Hello? Hello? So we have these similarities between uh, the United Monarchy and the 21st Dynasty of uh, Egypt. And uh, those similarities continue into the actual United Monarchy itself. So uh, we, we have the daughter of uh, King David, who I have uh, the combined name of Makatamar, uh, but the daughter of the Pharaoh of uh, the 21st dynasty was called Maka, uh, Makara Mutamhat. So we have Makatamar and Makara Mutamhat, hmm. the same sort of name. Uh -huh. um, and then the famous commander, army commander of uh, King David was called Joab. But the army commander of this pharaoh was called Joabanjed. It's wow. the same name. And not only is it the same name, it has the same meaning because um, uh, Joab, the commander of King David, was known to be the commander of thousands. That was his title. He was the commander of thousands. But in Egyptian, Joab means 10,000. So not only is it the same name, it has exactly the same meaning. So there's all these many connections between um, the 21st dynasty of Tanis in Egypt and the United Monarchy, because remember, these pharaohs did not rule from um, uh, modern Cairo or down in uh, Thebes. They actually ruled from Tanis, which is up in the Nile Delta, which is only a stone's throw away from, from Judea. And of course, Tanis was called Zoan, whereas Jerusalem was called Zion. Zoan, Zion. Um, they are very much the same name. Um, so, yeah, that came out of my book, Solomon, Pharaoh of Egypt, and the, the unlimited number of similarities between the United Monarchy and the 21st Dynasty of Egypt. So, yeah, that's all very interesting. Mm. Yeah, That's sorry really, about um, that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. He he wanted me to ask you about the religions at the time you were talking about, and he kept it. Sorry about that. Um, that's what he wanted to know. He wanted to know what the religion of Egypt was at the time of the Hyksos um, being spelled. 
Well, the um, the the Hyksos were a fully Egyptianized people. Now they're supposed to have come in from Mesopotamia, um, so they have a history that's very very similar to the Israelites coming down from Haran. Um, they came down from Mesopotamia as well, and they took over Egypt. We don't know if it's fully by force or whether it was just through infiltration, as it were, but they took over Lower Egypt. Um, that's all of the Nile Delta, basically, down as far as modern Cairo. And they were fully Egyptianized. You would never really know the difference between the two. Um, and their religion, therefore, was, was very much the same as Egypt. The only difference was they focused more on Seth instead of someone like, you know, Osiris or, uh, or Ra or anyone else. So they had... Um, lots of uh, imagery of Seth and then later on they had lots of imagery of Sekhmet as well uh, who is the lion god of Egypt and that's why you know one of the towns down there was called Leontopolis mm -hmm. by the Greeks because it had so many of these uh, images of Sekhmet who is the, the lion goddess um, and uh, what about what else about them? Um, yeah, I, th I think the main thing to uh, to to know is is that they were. You would not know them from any other Egyptians, so they didn't appear to be a foreign occupying force. They were fully Egyptian, um, and they were polytheistic, of course. But then the United Monarchy was polytheistic anyway. Uh, David and was it Solomon or David? I think it was Solomon raised temples to three of the different gods. Um, so, and, and they were always, you know, the priests were always riling against these other gods that they were making temples for. And when some of the, um, uh, some of the United, uh, no, this is going um, through to the Babylonian exile. There were two Babylonian exiles. There was a Babylonian exile where um, many people were taken into captivity in Babylon, obviously. But there was also a secondary exile when they started a second uprising against the Babylonians. And a load of people were actually pushed out of Jerusalem and ended up going south into Egypt. Uh, this is in the book of Jeremiah. Now, all of those people on that second exodus, as it were, they were um, worshipping the Queen of Heaven. And the Queen of Heaven is the Queen of the Stars. She is an incarnation of Isis. And so they were worshipping Isis. And so, yeah, uh, the uh, Israelites and the, the later Jews were polytheistic for many mm. centuries. Wow. I don't know if, uh, Bob, do you want to add, add to that with the polytheism of early Israel? It seems to have hung on quite a while because one of these uh, um, extra Canaanite or whatever you'd say uh, temples, uh, there's a surviving inscription of the gods they worshipped. Uh, and there was Yahweh, but there were several others, including Ahura Mazda. I mean, it, it must have been much, it's like the Nag Hammadi texts. It, it gives you a window into an unsuspected uh, large um diversity that we uh, that under the influence of traditional Jewish and Christian apologetics we wouldn't expect it because the idea was oh yeah M Moses taught monotheism and when the, the Bible several times shows the the uh, Israelites the Jews uh, whoring after the heathen and worshiping their gods they said oh you see they they just couldn't uh stick with monotheism when in fact uh the uh they they couldn't help mentioning the pagan uh, elements of the ancient israelite religion but how are you going to square that with mosaic monotheism well they just kept backsliding and uh, and so forth and in fact it's a, a revision it, revisionist history after the deuteronomic reform where they streamlined it and said no there's just uh, the one god that's yahweh and el elyan uh, 
jammed together and uh, the sons of God become angels and the Messiah becomes a human being, no sacred king anymore. And uh, so, well, then they recast the past. Uh, and when, when Joshua's fighting uh, those darn uh, pagan Canaanites, uh, the, these Canaanites were ancient Israel. What they're really doing is to tell their contemporaries, let's just leave that behind us. Let's fight any existing vestige of it. And there were plenty because a lot of that stuff survived in Christianity and Gnosticism, as Margaret Barker says. So yeah, uh, that that is, they were, well, hey, how about Second Maccabees? That late, they're finding Jewish patriots uh, who were killed in, in fighting the Seleucids, and they've got protective amulets, which apparently didn't work too well, uh, featuring the gods of Jaffa. Uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> They're fighting for monotheism? So something is, is artificial about that whole thing. Yeah, all the way through um, the text, you, you'll, you'll find they, they were... They were venerating sacred groves, which people tried to cut down all the time. And then they had these sacred poles, which they mm. um, they uh, covered with silver and then cloth. And it's mm. pretty obvious to me that these sacred poles are what we would call a maypole. It sounds mm -hmm. exactly the same as when I was a kid. I, I don't think kids do this anymore. But anyway, when I was a kid, we had a maypole in our junior school. And mm. we all had to dance around the maypole, all Whoa. carrying a piece of cloth in our hand. And then you would wrap this pretty pattern of, of ribbons around the top of the pole because of all the kids dancing around the bottom in a, a you know a particular fashion. Mm. Um, it, it sounds obvious to me that they were using maypoles. Um, mm. And of course, a maypole is a phallic symbol, so that yep. you know, they still had those. You, they have a great depiction of that in the Wicker Man. Uh, in oh, that right. movie. Yeah. Yeah. oh man, fascinating! <laughs> yes, that mm. was a frightening film. Yes, <laughs> I was only a kid then, and I was I was <laughs> frightened out of my rip wits at that one. <laughs> well, they did their job then. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mm. indeed. Hey, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Bob, can you go through the questions over here on in in the comment because I'm over. Uh, let's the, see. The, the, um, uh, Carl says questions, but we'll get to them after that. Uh, Carl says the uh, Hyksos or Hyksos got their tech from pre-existing Indo-European peoples who first invited, uh, in, I think you mean invented and spread the use of the chariot, solar worship, language, polytheism, etc. Interesting stuff. Uh, uh, then uh, who was that yeah, again? Well, they, they were fairly advanced. They were supposed to have had, you know, things like the composite bow and the chariot, which the Egyptians didn't have, and they were using horses. And I don't think the Egyptians had horses at that time. And... Um, one of the um, images I've got here is of the um, uh, the mathematical pyrus, the um, of the Hyksos. So they were quite literate in terms of um, mathematics as well. I think it's called the Rhind Papyrus, which is a Hyksos document, and it wow. has a lot of the um, mathematics that we would uh, be using today um do i have an image of that let's have a look yes if you uh, just uh, share the oh. screen again now that's the rind uh, papyrus uh it's in the british museum now of course and it has a lot of the standard mathematics that we would be using today in teaching to children and they were using it then and this is a Hyksos document. So, um, yeah, they were uh, fairly advanced. I always used to tell my students uh, in various courses, uh, we're so arrogant, we, we tend to think the ancients were stupid. And uh, that's so wrong. I mean, we're just catching up to them in some ways. Yeah, yes. Mm. Um, yeah, I think their education system would have been no less rigorous mm. uh, than it is today. 
Mm. Uh, different subjects, maybe, but <laughs> mm. a bigger emphasis on religion, perhaps. Mm. I'm going to uh, add. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to see what there was uh, to read here. Go ahead. Okay. Daniel Hopkins says Egyptian pata is etymologized. Oh, well. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm right, sorry. He just went back. He keeps going back. Egyptian pata is etymologized as the opener. Kangi Arab ifta, open Sanskrit Buddha, awaken the Gothic bud, expand Hebrew. Pathith <laughs> expanse Gnostic Bithos. Can you read that, uh, 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 Ralph? Uh, no, it's a bit small. Um, Buddha awaken. So, uh, Ta is supposedly the root of these others, or uh, just another uh, flower on the same vine? Because I do, I see the similarities pointing out. Um, well, I was just going to mention that there is um, a connection with Batar here and the uh, Old Testament. So, again, it's easy to uh, link all of this up to mm. um, the Old Testament again, because mm. we, we get these names from uh, Manetho, who wrote, he's a third century BC Egyptian historian. He wrote a lot of this information which connects with the Old Testament. Um, so he says that um, the... Now, he's, he's looking at the people of the Exodus here. Uh, so he calls Moses uh, Ossosef. So this is the biblical Moses, and he calls him Ossosef. <laughs> and that name was derived from Osar, meaning the son of Osiris. So Sef in Egyptian, Sef always means son of. Osar came from Osiris. <laughs> so the name for Moses, the biblical Moses, was Ossosef or the son of Osiris. Wow. And he actually says that. So um, we, we get that translation from Manetho. But then he also, he calls Joseph, him of the coat of many colors, he calls him Petasef. Now, Seth we know means son of in Egyptian. So Petasef is the son of Petar. Hmm. So there, yeah, there is a mention. So Moses was um, uh, connected with Osiris, and Joseph was connected with Petar. But we also get that from um, from the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, Joseph was called Zapnath Pania, or Sotham Panich, if you read Josephus, so he has a slightly different um, uh, in, uh, different pronunciation. So in the Old Testament, it was Zapnath Pania. Hmm. Now, if you change the Z to an S, we get Sephnath Pania. Now, Seph is son of again, the same as we've seen before. Now, Neth is Neith, the goddess Neith. Now, there's a direct connection there because Neith was the wife of Ptah. Hmm. So we have a direct connection where these two different documents are identifying Joseph with Ptah and the wife of Ptah. Hmm. So I, I suspect that they're probably correct in that because they've managed to get the same god and goddess together that he was identified with both of these. And of course, from this sort of Masonic type of point of view of these people being in an early form of uh, masonry, Patar is the god of Freemasons because hmm. he is the original architect. So he's honored within Freemasonry. Um, so yeah, that's um, Patar you can call as, as, as very much the same as a tecton. And of course, Jesus in the Gospels was known as a tecton, an architect. Mm. The tar mm. was the original architect. So again, Jesus is being um, identified with the same God as Joseph was. Hmm. So he's following in the footsteps of, of Joseph. Yeah, I think Joseph was the Hebrew Osiris and Jesus is the Christian Joseph. 
Yeah, um, I mean, it, that could be where we get the name for the father of, jo of, of Jesus from, you know, the, in mm. my works, looking at, you know, the history of uh, Jesus coming from Edessa, there is no mention of Joseph, of course. But mm. if Jesus was linked to Petar and therefore to Petasef, what well, Joseph was Petasef. It, it's, a, you know, an mm. obvious family name if they're carrying on that tradition. Mm. Well, this is uh, probably utterly gratuitous, but I, I have a friend who's a, an Egyptologist, and we used to correspond a good bit. And uh, I started giving her the nickname Ankh S. Enamon, which I got out of the Karloff Mummy movie, and she would address me as Tahotep. I, I'm not sure w what that means exactly, but uh, it's sort of a nickname of mine. I got a list of them <laughs> a mile long. Uh, can I insert a question here that I feel guilty since there are a whole mess of them here, but uh, uh, what do you think of the books of uh, Zechariah Sitchin with the Anunnaki? I'm hearing about that all the time, and I've read his first <laughs> book. I found it quite fascinating, but I couldn't quite buy it. Uh, what's your opinion of uh no, I've I've never read Stitchin, so um, I try and keep away from some of those books because, I, you know, to be honest, I don't even want to be influenced by them. I want to do my own research right, and see yeah. what I, conclusions I come to. Mm -hmm. So I never mention the Anunnaki at all. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, while the possibility of, you know, alien intervention could be invoked maybe way back in the uh, early dynasties we have no evidence for that and so mm. i would like to start on pure history first mm. before we go into total mm. speculation mm -hmm. so yeah i don't mention the anunnaki at all mainly because none of that none of those explanations can be linked back to real history therefore they mm. cannot be proven right. Therefore, it all becomes speculation, at least when we're talking about um, a lot of these Old Testament events, we can connect it back into real history, like mm -hmm. using uh, the eruption of Santorini, mm -hmm. um, because that's a real event in history which does occur in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus. I'm pretty sure that that's exactly what it's talking mm -hmm. about. But that's so valuable because it gives us a chronological peg mm. upon which we can hang the rest of the story. Because mm -hmm. if we link up those two events, then we can quite safely say that the Exodus took place in 1580 BC. Mm. To the nearest, plus or minus, I don't know, 15 years or something. Um, so that gives us a real hard peg upon which you can then cast the rest of the Old Testament story. Hmm. So all of that is very valuable. So it's, it's, it's useful. Hmm. Yeah, uh, F.C. Bauer, one of my heroes, said that uh, uh, anything is possible uh, but that doesn't mean it happened. And he said uh, that uh, many theories deal in what is plausible, but the historian wants to know what is probable, because otherwise you're just floating in a sea of, oh, what if this? What if that? <laughs> yeah, what about this? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's true. Yes, you can speculate on anything. So mm -hmm. uh, to keep it within hard facts, because, you know, even with my critics, they still say I'm speculating. Mm -hmm. Um but my speculations are always based on at least five different um, points of view that point in the same direction. Mm. So, you know, things like we were just talking about the army commander of King David mm -hmm. was called Joab. Well, it's mm. very nice to suddenly find that Joab is not just a similar name, mm. but it means exactly the same as in the Old Testament as it did in ancient Egyptian, the name means the same. Mm -hmm. It means the commander of thousands. So you need these double and treble and quadruple connections before you can start to say that you've, you've found something historical. But, mm -hmm. you know, with the um, investigation into uh, Solomon and David, I'm probably looking at um, 20 or 30 
different connections wow. which all point towards the same answer mm. so only then when you start to get all of these multiple um pieces of evidence can you really say that you're on to something um mm. and so it's not just a mere connection of names and um of course i sent this information to um professor Pinkelstein, of course, who's one of the great uh, archaeologists of uh, Israel. And his answer, because it's very difficult, because it's very political, you can imagine, for Israel, this re-identification. And his answer was just because all of the names are the same, it doesn't mean they're the same people. But I see why he would reject it, because if, if what I'm saying is true, then the true homeland of the modern israelites is the nile delta hmm. so then th their promised land is actually the nile delta <laughs> hmm. not not modern judea and so that becomes highly political of, as mm -hmm. you can imagine mm. in the modern era and so people will have to reject it there's no way they can accept it mm. there's no way they can say that the nile delta belongs <laughs> to the modern israelites mm. um yeah politically unacceptable well when i discuss your work with people that are just horrified by it like certain people you know uh <laughs> that i say to them you don't understand what historical theorizing is about uh you you create as with science you create an interpretive paradigm and see if the new way you can construe connecting all the dots makes more sense of things than previous frameworks do. You don't have a time machine. You can't go back and dogmatize about it, but that's what you're doing. And you've got more guts than a lot of people. Uh, and it's they say, oh, it's just fantastic. Well, that's what they said about everything that we now think. Uh, you have to yeah. realize that it's a succession of paradigms. And as Fa Paul Feyerabin said, the only maxim that does not inhibit research is anything goes. You've got mm -hmm. wherever it comes from, explore the theory and see how far you can take it. And it seems to me it's obvious that's what you're doing. And they, they yep. just don't seem to understand that. And, and it becomes explanatory as well, because it explains yeah. things that uh, were, were totally inexplicable previously. Right. Nobody could understand what these things were. I mean, like um, the United Monarchy being the richest and most powerful monarchy in the whole of the region, which clearly did not exist in Judea at that time. But if you go down into the Nile Delta and look at uh, Tanis with the uh, 21st dynasty, it was the most powerful monarchy of this era. Mm. So that fits in with the biblical story. And then we get the subplot of, you know, King Solomon's mines, which has always remained a mystery. Where did all this gold come from? Mm. Mines in the plural, of course, not just one mine, but... Mm. King Solomon's mines, but King, not Solomon, but the 21st dynasty Pharaoh of Egypt, he was mining gold mm. from the 18th dynasty tombs. What they had started doing, because we're in the 21st dynasty now, they were demanding tribute from the Southern Egyptians. E Egypt was divided yet again. So there was another mm. civil war between North and South. And the North was demanding tribute from the South. And they didn't have it. So in order to give them tri tribute, they started robbing the 18th dynasty tombs of the pharaohs. Huh. And we know they were doing that because all of the art, well, all, many of the artifacts that ended up in Tanis came from the 18th din dynasty tombs. Hmm. So they were robbing these tombs, using them as mines, to get gold so they could pay off um, the 21st dynasty pharaohs in the north. And that is what I think they were talking about when they were talking about King Solomon's mines. Huh. They were talking about robbing the tombs of the 21st, uh, of the 18th dynasty. And we have a record of them doing it. There's, there's um, a court case, would you believe, which I always find fascinating that they've got a document that gives the court case against the um, 
um, the administrator of the Valley of the Kings, who was accused of robbing the tombs. And they had this court case saying, you're guilty. No, I'm not, etc. You know, all the rest of it. And then he was punished at the end of it. Um, but I don't think this was just an administrator down in Thebes that was robbing the Valley of the Kings. I think this was state-sponsored. They needed the money. Where were they going to get it from? They started robbing the tombs. Because some of these artifacts going back to the north were sarcophagi. You, you can't run out of a tomb, you know, silently in the middle of the night with a huge great granite sarcophagus. Um, it was it was obviously state sponsored and they were mm. taking this stuff and sending it up north to the 21st dynasty uh, pharaohs. It's like you um, could invoke the, the cliche robbing Peter to pay Ptah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what they were doing. Yeah. Um, yes. All very interesting. So yes, it does become explanatory and it, it, it explains almost every facet of the uh, United monarchy story. Mm. Um if we can align the United Monarchy with the 21st Dynasty. Hmm. Wow. Well, I'm sorry, but earlier I have all the, uh, I had to fix it, but uh, fix the technical problems that I was having there. Um, I have a question. Mr. Ellis, in your fascinating explorations of history, have you ever considered the possibility that ancient aliens might have played a role in shaping the events you discuss in your books? Could Jesus possibly have been an extraterrestrial envoy rather than an historical figure? Uh, could could those... Jesus have been? Yeah, that's this uh, question no. through Twitter. Um, I, I don't in any of my religious books because it's uh, getting far too speculative to uh, jump into that because we have no evidence whatsoever. Um, the only time I mention that possibility is when looking at the um, uh, the megaliths because some of these megaliths are just almost impossible to fathom how they were um, using them and moving them. Um, when I was in Lebanon, down at the um, Temple of Baalbek, um, the biggest stone there was 1,400 tons. Um, yeah, 1,400 tons. Now, how on earth do you move a brick of that nature? in order to make the temple platform for the um, Temple of Baalbek. Now, there's mm. clearly two layers to this temple. They say it's Roman, but quite obviously, it's, if you go into the tunnels underneath, because there are two, three big tunnels that go underneath the temple platform, and there are two building uh, eras. You can see the bottom uh, level is megalithic, it's ancient. And then up above it, where they've put the roof, it's obviously Roman. So we have two completely different building eras. Mm. And the megalithic era is much, much older than the Roman era. And they were building in a fashion that we can barely build today. Um, back in the 1980s, when uh, we made one of our nuclear power stations, they had to put the roof on the, um, which is a, a concrete roof that's supposed to manage to resist aircraft hitting it and so on. So this is vast concrete roof had to go on the top of the uh, uh, reactor building, which weighed a thousand tons. And they had to get three of the largest cranes in the world in order to lift this thing and put it in position. Um, that's how difficult it is to work with stones of that nature. So in passing, when talking about the megaliths, I do mention the possibility of uh, alien sort of intervention in terms of uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, because I was brought up on that film. That was, mm. you know, that was my era. Um, mm. I was taken to see that by my brother, so I saw it at a very early age. We do. And that is the basis of many Masonic uh, lodges believe in the same possibilities. That's what they teach. Hmm. So one of the um, foundations of Masonry is that um, the, the gods did come down, as it were, and taught early man 
how to survive, mm. just as in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Mm. So that's quite a widespread belief, but it's not talked about very much. Mm. But I don't talk about it in any of my religious research because that's all in the far ancient distant past mm. and it doesn't pertain to the modern world and regard the, the modern fascination with this. We get the American government talking about it every two minutes. Um, that is a, um, that's a smoke screen that's covering up. It, it always happens that every time the government is in trouble, they start talking about UFOs. They're, I mean, literally, they're just diverting attention away from mm -hmm. their own troubles, basically. Mm -hmm. um, you would not get a superior civilization to cross 500 light years of space in order to come here and play silly buggers <laughs> with the American Air Force. I mean, that's just not how it's going to happen. If we had a visitation from a superior race from another planet, you would know all about it. There's no way that you wouldn't. It would be more like a scenario either from 2001 or what was that other film? Uh, Contact. Um, mm -hmm. it, it would be a scenario like that, you know, the, the film mm -hmm. Contact with um, Jodie Foster. Mm -hmm. It would be something that everybody would end up knowing about. Or uh, uh, Independence Day. Yeah, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm. Yes, but they're not going to come 500 light years to draw pretty patterns in a cornfield. I mean, that's <laughs> just not, it's not what they're going to do. <laughs> but, you know, the history of a potential visitation, because everyone says, you know, the gods came down. That was a very firm belief in ancient times. Now, if you translate that into not you know, some sort of spiritual God coming down, but a real physical being God coming down. Um, they could have left their mark on theology for the next X thousands of years because people would have known about it and passed on the, uh, uh, the history of, of that visitation. And that could have influenced religion all the way through Judaism, Christianity into the modern era. Mm -hmm. It's entirely possible. But, of course, we don't have any proof of that. Um, yeah. The only thing we do have which shows that people are connecting the modern era with the past era um, is that the modern grey, you know, everyone portrays uh, aliens as the modern grey. Um, the modern grey is Pharaoh Akhenaten. That's where they got yeah. the image from. Wow. Um, and so they're connecting the modern era of the alien invasion with the ancient era of Akhenaten and the Amarna dynasty. So people are obviously connecting these dots up. Mm. They might be going two plus two equals five. Who, who knows? Um, we don't know if they're correct or not, but someone is joining up dots. Mm -hmm. Brian Lumley's novel, Kai of Ancient Chem, which I think is one of his best, uh, it has that premise that the pharaohs were aliens and so on. And it's, it's not a stupid idea. I mean, the problem is when people leap to uh, make it their personal creed and they're sure it happened. Wait just a minute. It's like Atlantis. It's not out of the question. It's it's not a crazy idea, but you, you can't just believe it because you want to. Mm. Yeah, I like the story of Atlantis because I really do think that Atlantis was Santorini. We mm -hmm. were talking about Santorini before. That makes sense. Um, but there are so many similarities um, between the two. Um, Santorini, before it blew, um, was an island with concentric circles inside it. Hmm. It had concentric circles of, of sea and land, sea and land, because that's oh, yeah. what a oh. nested caldera does. It breaks up into concentric circles. Hmm. And then it did sink beneath the waves. Um, hmm. And yes, everyone was destroyed. And um, the book I like for that is this one, I would recommend it. Um, Fire in the Sea, 
um, the theory that Santorini uh, is Atlantis. I yeah. think it's got legs, that story. Um, hmm. I think it uh, it makes a lot of sense that that this was a memory of the Thera eruption, hmm. uh, Thera being Santorini, same, same place, um, because that would have left its mark on civilization. It was the mm. biggest eruption in recorded history. Mm. And all of the peoples around the Mediterranean were affected by it. And the sailors crossing the sea would have seen this enormous uh, volcano, this enormous eruption. It would have left an indelible mark on people's minds and on their um, uh, on their writings that, you know, they... they and their stories that they cast for future generations. Mm -hmm. So I, a story like Atlantis coming out of Santorini, I can believe that quite easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and this business about, um, uh, just very quickly, this business about um, uh, Atlantis being larger than Asia and Africa, mm, the I word being yeah some something like that it says in the atlantis story but mm. the word being used is the same word that they use for between mm. so it might be saying that atlantis was between asia and africa not larger than huh. so again you can see how you know mistranslations can change the story somewhat mm. All right. Oh. Um, another question from Twitter. This this comes from Ice. Um, Mr. Ellis, given your groundbreaking theories connecting biblical figures to historical rulers, here's a lighthearted one. If you were to organize a historical dinner party, which ancient personalities, real or hypothetical, would you invite? What topic do you think they'd be most eager to discuss <laughs> over dinner? Oh, I don't know, actually. Um, there's so many interesting eras to actually choose from. Where do you go? Do you go to um, recent past? I mean, by recent past, I mean, you know, the kings and queens of England, or do you go back to the ancient past? Um, I suppose it would be more interesting to go to the ancient past because we have less firm information about those eras and so you'd find out a lot more interesting information um i suppose in a way i would like to go back and see the pyramids being built that would be interesting because mm. i'm interested in architecture and, and science all of these pyramids contain mathematics i'd like to go and just have a look over the shoulder of the designer who has these drawings on his drawing board and see what they were actually trying to do. So I think that would be, um, yeah, very worthwhile. If you had all these people collected, it seems obvious to me, the topic of conversation would be your theories. Well, yes. Yeah. I'd have to introduce that of course. And just, um, yeah, say, uh, am I on the right track here, chaps? Um, yeah, that would be interesting. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that at some point some somebody will find some information that sort of uh, sheds more light on this. Yeah. What I want people to do is find something like um, uh, the history of the kings of Judea mm. by Justice of Tiberius. Oh, now that would be interesting because we know mm. that book existed because Josephus Flavius hates it. Yeah. Um, he says it's a complete tissue of lies. Uh, what he means is it gives an alternative perspective yeah. to the one given to us by yeah. Josephus. So I'd like to see what Justice of Tiberius wrote. That would oh, be very yeah. interesting. Mm. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, here's one. I mean, I think you might have already answered this question, um, but... Uh, Ralph, considering your alternative perspectives on historical figures, if you had a time machine and could witness any event from the past, which moment would you choose? And how might your presence there change our understanding of history? Yeah, I think we've sort of answered that one, haven't we? Uh, yeah, I would go back to the pyramid era and, and have a look there. But uh, what, what about yourself, Bob? What would you um, like to go and see? 
Uh, well, inevitably, I'd like to go to uh, uh, Galilee when uh, uh, when Jesus ostensibly lived, though the big problem there would be they don't have any restrooms. But uh, <laughs> other than that, uh, I'd love to. Uh, there are, of course, science fiction novels where people do that, including Michael Moorcock's Behold the Man, which is very interesting. But I, I don't know how, like, if you couldn't find Jesus, where any of you guys ever heard of Jesus the Nazarene? Uh, not me, not me. Like, uh, maybe I just missed him. Uh, how many times did you make the trip? But that, I guess, would be my <laughs> yeah. big question. Yes, if, if you transport yourself back into uh, AD 25, you might not see him because he might have been there in AD 65. <laughs> mm, you just missed him. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a few more decades. He hasn't been born yet, you know. <laughs> All right. We've got another one coming through Twitter. Mr. Ellis, in the spirit of your unconventional theories, if you were to cast a Hollywood blockbuster based on your historical narratives, Oh. Who would be your dream actors to portray key figures like Jesus, Cleopatra, and King Solomon? And of course, what would be the title of this epic film? Mm. Ta da! Yes, that I'd I, like I, I to would, see. Yeah, I would like to see. Uh, I would like to see it actually just done because we 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 cannot say this is definitive evidence of what happened in the past but i'd like to see it done as a, a fictional yeah semi, semi fictional historical story <laughs> about um um an alternative perspective into the ancient past hmm. and just show the film as we think it might have happened and let people decide um that would be very interesting actually and i think it would amaze quite a lot of people because they would then see the many parallels Mm -hmm. that do exist between this new theory and the old classical interpretation. I don't know who um, should be playing it because really I, I know no actors whatsoever. I never, I never really watch films and I don't follow Hollywood. So I don't know the names of anyone in Hollywood. So unlike many people who sort of exist on Hollywood um, epics and films. Um, um uh, the director of uh, oh, a lot of uh, films like well, my favorite, uh, Starship Troopers, but a bunch of other things, Paul uh, Verhoeven, he was a fellow of the Jesus Seminar when I was involved with it. I don't know if he still is, but he was dead set for years on doing a film of his version of Jesus. And uh, I said, well, have you got anybody in mind to play Jesus? And he, he didn't. I said, well, how about... Uh, Johnny Depp, uh, he, he'd be good. And he said, yeah, Johnny Depp is good. And uh, I, I wish he'd have done it. I think he dropped the idea, but that'd be good. This would be better. Yeah, it would. Well, uh, you know, everybody's had a go at the, you know, the Jesus character and they've, mm. they've portrayed him in various different f uh, fashions. And we got that um, terribly graphic one you know very classical jesus being crucified by whoever that was i forget what his name was now um, um yeah mel gibson right mel gibson yeah that was his own personal view of what the jesus character right. was but it's such a ridiculous pastiche of of classical ideas about you know the persecution of a poor carpenter and you think oh dear me can't they get beyond the poor carpenter business, you know? Um, I mean, he wasn't called a carpenter anyway. He was called a tecton. He's a, he was an architect. Um, he was a follower of Patar, as we've just been saying. Yeah. Nothing to do with that classical interpretation. And yet they make a film based on the classical interpretation. And the, um, the more realistic version uh, doesn't get aired, so people don't know anything about it, which mm. is um, a bit of a shame. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's any truth to the rumor that the original working title was Golgotha Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, <laughs> I, maybe not, though. I, don't know. I think that would be more suitable. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even watch it because I knew what it was going to be like. You know, it's just layering on. You know the. Um, uh, the, oh, I forget what you might call it, but 
um, laying it on thick, you know, for the believers that, oh, our poor Jesus was persecuted. Look at this persecution, those mm. terrible Romans, those terrible Jews. Um, mm. y- you know what the subplot was on a film like that. But, mm. uh, yeah, nothing to do with real history whatsoever. Mm. We have another question. It's the same person. Her name is Penny Wise, and she's in Birmingham, England. Uh-huh. And she says, Mr. Ellis, let's envision a historical game show where contestants guess the true identities of key figures based on your alternative theories. If you were the host, <laughs> what would be the show's name and what clever catchphrase would you use to reveal the surprising historical connections? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if that would go down very well as a, you know doing a um, a screenplay of that and putting it towards BBC producers. I don't think they would choose that one. Um, How yeah, about watch- name that Christ? <laughs> yeah, yes. Sorry. Yeah, it would be something like that. Um, yeah, I don't watch game shows again. I, I don't watch any television at all, really. So. Mm. Um, I'm not the one to ask about that. I've not had a a BBC subscription for uh, about 15 years. In in Britain, it's compulsory that you must pay for the BBC. It's a tax that we get taxed to pay for the BBC. But there is a get out if you say you don't ever watch live television. You You can get out of it. So I haven't paid anything to the BBC for years and years and years. Um... They went down the tubes 20 years ago. Uh, it used to be a very valuable source of information and, and quite reliable. But now all they do is they just push <clears throat> all of these um, woke uh, ideologies is what they're doing. They're pushing climate change down us and uh, uh, obviously everything to do with COVID. They pushed all of that down us mm-hmm. and uh, everything else. And with climate, it's, it's, it's even worse. And it shows the control that various pressure groups have Mm. over the wider population. So the BBC is supposed to be 100% independent and unbiased. And then in 2005, I think it was, they had a a conference on climate, uh, which included 28 climate scientists, which is why it was called BBC 28. And they decided at that uh, conference to never give the alternative opinions and data about climate. So they went all in with climate change and CO2. But some people had some suspicions about this and they put in freedom of information. Mm -hmm. And the BBC fought these freedom of information requests for five years, spending hundreds of thousands of pounds in court so they wouldn't have to give any details uh, of this conference. And finally, the, um, uh, the name list, uh, the attendees was leaked. Um, and there was only two climate scientists there. So all of the other people were like BBC executives, people from Greenpeace, people from the, um, uh, you know, WWF, the World Wildlife or whatever it is, Foundation. <laughs> All of these people were there. So all of this was decided by activists, not not by climate scientists. And so the BBC decided more than 15 years ago now to never give any alternate information about climate. So all you get is the standard narrative. So that, that's the problem with the propaganda we have. Mm. And they did exactly the same with COVID. Exactly the same. It was just propaganda after propaganda. Um, and, and the people involved didn't believe it themselves. So mm-hmm. um, the person who did, the professor who did all of the modeling for COVID, uh, who's a known alarmist, uh, he was known as Professor Pants Down because he was, <coughs> he, he was, um, forecasting like 5 million dead or something daft, which precipitated, of course, all of the lockdowns. Uh And then during the lockdowns, he was disappearing off up the motorway to go and shag his girlfriend. (laughs) So the only person who wasn't locking himself down was the guy who uh, um, 
instituted it. And then our, um, yeah, people in America probably won't know this, but anyway, our politicians were disregarding it as well. So you were not allowed to have any gatherings, meetings or parties. That was just forbidden under the rules. So much so that I was still working. So I was in a hotel um, as a, um, a protected worker. We had to work. So we're in this hotel. The hotel is completely empty apart from us workers who all work together anyway. So we'd been working together all day. There was like six or eight of us. And so we went to the hotel. We sat around in a big circle, all separated, you know, by a meter, meter and a half uh, in a big circle, having a beer. And they called the police on us. So the police came down and sent us to our rooms like naughty boys. So we were all very upset about that, disgusted, you know. And then we find out later that our parliamentarians were all having a big party down at number 10. Uh, number 10 <laughs> being the um, office of the prime minister. Mm. Um, <laughs> so they were having a party quite mm. merrily. But I get sent to my room by the police. Um, oh. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a bit of a tangent, but it just shows that you cannot really believe anything that these people are saying sometimes. Well, I am very proud that we had the honor of having you on explaining your alternative and I think much more cogent approach to the whole climate change thing. Uh, I hope that goes far and wide. Yes, I've been doing quite a lot of talks about this because we're our, our local councils now, our local government is being pushed in, into uh, net zero. So because of clim climate change, they want to change our entire energy system onto all electric and all renewable. So I've been doing these talks to uh, local uh, government saying how impossible this is. <coughs> especially if they want to do it within the next 20, 25 years, um, because all of their proposals are utterly ridiculous. Mm. Um, what they've done is they want to go all renewable and they've tried to cost this out, but they haven't costed in or mentioned half the time any sort of backup. <laughs> so if mm. we have um, renewables, which is very intermittent very unreliable mm. uh, you need some sort of backup system for when the wind mm. is not blowing the sun is not shining now at present we're using gas methane gas now if that's not working then we need a backup system so they've costed out all of these renewables without adding in any backup mm. so under their current proposals uh what will happen is that as soon as the uh, wind stops blowing everything will go dark <laughs> because their proposals are just ridiculous. And then there was another proposal that said we could change the whole of the UK uh, energy system onto electricity by 2025, by 2050, um, costing 410 billion pounds which is something like, I don't know, $600 billion. But that's a huge, great underestimate because I did a similar costing using the same uh, costs that we're spending now on wind farms in the North Sea. And my version came out at 4,000 billion. Um, it was 10 times the cost that the government um, advisors were saying. Um, <laughs> But I think the government advisors are doing this purposely. They're trying mm. to underestimate the costs in order to make it look feasible. Mm. And therefore, they'll you know, draw the politicians down this um, rocky road to renewable ruin, basically, mm. by saying it's cheap and easy. And of course, it won't be cheap and easy at all. It's going to be very, very expensive and very difficult. So I've been doing quite a few talks on that, which is quite interesting. 
I saw this great cartoon years ago in Time or Newsweek. Uh, this guy is on, like a roadie for a rock concert is on the stage and it's filled with gigantic machinery. Uh, and the a sign says, world's first solar powered rock concert. And you see him saying, it is on. <laughs> yeah, I, I we had it. the same we had the same with the BBC. This was going back a few years. It's probably 10 years ago. Um, and the BBC, on their morning program, they were going to have the first live transmission powered uh -oh. by a um, wind turbine. So they had this big truck out there, wind turbine in the background, reporter sitting there. And he said, well, this morning we are having the uh, first live broadcast by wind power um and you could see the blades behind him were stationary and he said well uh, as it happens this morning we don't have any wind this morning so we're, we're using the diesel generator but if that turbine had been working <coughs> yeah brilliant oh. <laughs> Yes, we uh, unfortunately we a... we're being led by fantasists at present. Yeah, and these yeah. fantasists think we can power a technological civilization on unicorn farts. Um, they don't really understand the problems and how much energy we actually use. You know, it's mm. absolutely vast the amounts of uh, energy we use at present, mm. and it's not easy to go and change it into a different form of energy in the space of 25 years. Mm. I, I, I remember there was um, um, an oil depot um, was set fire to. Um, this is going back again about um, eight years, maybe 10 years. And there was this enormous great fire with this oil storage depot was going up in flames. And there was these big tanks, you know, all burning. And everyone's saying, oh, yeah. We, we're going to run out of energy if we lose all of this oil. And then someone said, well, actually, that amount of oil, that'll probably power the nation for about an hour or two hours. <laughs> it might look a lot, you know, going up in flames. But in terms of the amount of energy we use, it was a drop in the ocean. You know, our energy use in the West is absolutely vast especially in america because uh, america uses more energy than almost anyone else um so yeah changing all of that to renewables is going to be um impossible basically yeah i have another question um here but the the lady i don't know she's uh wants me to read this with my best british accent <laughs> and, do you uh, have a best one <laughs> I don't know. I mean, she said, she says, please re read this in your best British accent. I will re her first remark of what you just said. This is a, came in after her question. These bastards have no bollocks. These balmy bastards. <laughs> Climate alarmists. I can't read what she read here. It's fucking. I just said it. You know, fucking bastards. You know, like the, I agree with you, Ralphie. Okay, next to the question. Mr. Ellis, in parallel universe where historical figures have social media accounts, what kind of posts do you think Jesus, Cleopatra, and King Solomon would share? Would they be liking <laughs> each other's posts? engaging in twitter debates or perhaps sharing ancient recipes on instagram <laughs> sorry it would be interesting to see what uh, the ancient world would do with the uh, technology we have today because we have very different problems to what they were having all of those uh, years ago but the thing i like about some of my research is it demonstrates that nothing really changes and they were doing the same things then as we're doing now and um the big thing of course regarding that is is roman propaganda so most of my um gospel reinterpretation is about roman propaganda 
Fine. They didn't want you to know about the uh, Jewish revolt and that mm. people could uh, revolt against Rome. And so they were doing their utmost to cover up the, the, the leaders of the Jewish revolt and the reasons for the Jewish revolt. Because even if you look today at classical histories of the Jewish revolt, it won't explain to you what on earth this was all about. Nobody will explain it. <clears throat> and they won't even explain who the leaders were. You know, there's a, a nebulous array of various people who are mentioned in the works of Josephus. Um, but nobody will say that it was the kings and princes of Edessa hmm. that started the Jewish revolt. Now, it's, it's fairly clear um, that uh, that is actually what happened, although other people will, will deny it. Um, because the Jewish revolt was started by uh, Kennedyus. Um, I'm just looking this, this up. Um, and uh, Monobazus. Um, so the outbreak of war for the um, Jewish revolt was when they destroyed the Roman legion of Cestius. Uh, that really was the start of the revolt because there was no going back after you've destroyed a Roman legion. There's no going back. You're, you're in this for the uh, long haul. And so at the outbreak of war, um, Josephus says that the most valiant in the battle against Cestius were the kinsmen of Monobazus, king of Adiabene, mm. and their names were Monobazus and Kennedius. Mm. Now, okay, he's mentioning Adiabene there, but what he doesn't mention is that the queen of Adiabene was the queen of Edessa. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the famous Queen Helena. She was married to King Abgarus of Edessa, so she was actually from Edessa. Um, and then at the end of the revolt, when they surrendered to uh, Rome, to uh, Titus, um, he says, on that same day, it was the uh, sons and brethren of King Izates of Edessa mm. and Diabeni who besought Caesar to give them his right hand for their security. And even though Caesar was uh, very angry with them, he did not lay aside his old moderation, but received them. Mm. He kept them all in jail and then bound the king's sons and kinsmen and led them with him to Rome in order to make them hostages for their country's fidelity to the Romans. So <clears throat> he did the usual thing. He took them into, um, into custody, into uh, jail, uh, to hold them there as uh, hostages so that if you know anyone else in Edessa wanted to start another uprising, mm. they would uh, get their heads cut off. Um, mm. So it's quite clear from these two, as uh, the, these two quotes within Josephus, that the people who started the Jewish revolt were the kings and princes of Edessa, and the reason they were doing that is because they wanted to take over Rome, because mm. Rome, the throne of Rome, was empty from AD sixty-eight onwards. And anyone with enough money and a big enough army could take over Rome and become the next emperor. So the, the king of uh, Edessa, who was called King Isus Manu, Isartes Manu, or Jesus Emmanuel, of course, would have become the next emperor of Rome. Mm. And we would have had a King Jesus on the throne mm. of Rome. Now, some people say that's impossible. You can't have this you know, small principality on the edge of the empire, taking over the whole empire. It's just not possible. Uh, well, actually, that did happen. Um, Queen Zenobia of Palmyra did exactly that. So if we fast forward a couple of hundred years to about uh, Zenobia, when was she around? She was about 270 AD, I think. Um, she was the queen of Palmyra, which was a city-state in the eastern uh, desert of Syria. And from that springboard, she took over all of the Near East, all of Syria, all of uh, uh, modern Israel, Jordan. She took over all of Egypt. She took over all of Anatolia, all of the East, Eastern Roman Empire. 
she took it all over and she was going to become the next emperor of Rome. But she was defeated. In the end, she was defeated and she was chased back to, um, back to Palmyra. And uh, yes, so she, she um, I might have a picture of her. Yes, if you can just bring this, this picture up. A quick share again. Uh, I've probably got to change it. So let me stop screen and then change it to another picture. Because it's in another screen. So if I share screen, choose a window and choose that one. How about that? Mm. There we go. That's um, Queen Zenobia's last look upon Palmyra. So <laughs> this is supposed to be the city of Palmyra. And of course, she's in golden chains because Rome had a habit of doing that. They <laughs> um, put you in golden chains and took you took you off to Rome to a, a deep dungeon. Uh, so, yes, she lost that war. And I use that image, of course, for my... Because Palmyra was um, a city controlled by Edessa. So I... Uh, obviously influenced by the Edessa monarchy. So I use that same picture for the um, cover of my jacket. So I changed Queen Zenobia <laughs> into King King Jesus. <laughs> You know, I, I have I have a sneaking hunch. I know what uh, uh, Jesus and uh, uh, Cleopatra and the others would have been saying on today's um, internet. I can just hear uh, uh, Cleopatra saying, uh, "Jesus, can you give me your recipe for turning water into wine?" And uh, who knows what he would have said? <laughs> guy, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, we've got that recipe here, actually, so I can um, <laughs> I, I can show you what it looks like. <laughs> um, mm. So if I go back into um, share screen, share a window, and here it is. There you go. Oh, yeah, ah. the... Yeah, so th this is the uh, uh, the um, trick jug by Hieron of Alexandria. Mm. So, um, and this is from the first century. So Hieron of Alexandria liked to make all sorts of wonderful mechanical trickery, uh, but his favourite thing was making uh, trick vases <laughs> that would turn water into wine. Oh, boy. So, and this is an original drawing of, of what he was uh, trying to make. So wow. um, there's, there's two compartments in here, of course, one compartment would have wine and the other compartment would have water. And depending on whether you put your thumb over the little hole at, at K on the top, um, you would either get wine or you'd get water. <laughs> it was a trick jug that was designed for the aristocracy to amaze their, um, their visitors that came to their wedding. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus used the same jug to amaze his guests at the wedding at Cana. And it was a trick jug by Hieron of Alexandria, who made these tricks for the aristocracy and for the monarchy and for the priesthood in order to amaze their, um, their followers or their guests. I wonder um, if that's what the Bible refers to as lying wonders. Because usually people <laughs> think of it as, oh, yeah, they, they were real miracles, all right, but uh, it was because uh, Satan uh, did it. But I suspect that, no, they mean fakery like this. Uh, don't be taken but, in. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, some of it was fakery, but um, in, in a way, I think it's more like um, uh, watching David Copperfield or something of that yeah. nature. Where right. you know you know it's magic it's just mm. that you don't know how it's done and that's that's the wonder of it you know i don't want mm. david copperfield or anyone else trying to explain to me right. how he does it that would just spoil the whole thing i don't want to yeah. know the details i want to try and imagine the details because i can't understand how he does these things you know mm. um the same with um simon magus of course you remember uh, bob where simon magus made a boy appear 
Um, and it, but it wasn't a real boy. It was an apparition of a boy. It was a ghost of a boy. Mm. But everyone was convinced that it's a boy, but it's not really a boy. Well, it's obviously one of these, which is a camera obscura. Oh. Um, so all you need for a camera obscura is a, a very light, bright background, which you would get in the Near East, of course, with a strong sun there, a small hole in the wall and a dark room. Because a camera obscura just means a dark room. That's what it means in the Latin. Um, and the image of whatever is outside will be shown on the inside. And so you will get, and these are quite fascinating because I was, even at, as, as, as a 20th century man, I was quite amazed hmm. by the quality of the image. Hmm. It's television quality or... <laughs> Um, projector quality, the same as we would get today with a good quality projector. That's the quality of the image you get on the wall. So for the you know select group of people you've got inside this dark room, they will see a boy. Mm. And it's a real boy. Not only is it the most perfect painting you've ever seen, because it's, um, it's, it's a really good image, but you can say to the boy, lift your arm, and the boy will lift his arm. Oh, boy. Wow. You can ask him questions, and you can see his mouth moving. It's a real boy, but it's not a real boy, because if you try and uh. touch him, he's not really there. The only uh. difference with this is, you, you know, to make it more realistic, you'd have to hang the boy upside down. Yeah, um, yeah. Because mm -hmm. the image is inverted. So you'd have to get some boy hanging by his feet. <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> With his hair tied up, maybe, so you don't see his hair flopping. Mm. Um, but apart from that, you could really amaze your guests with, huh. with this sort of uh, uh, magic. It would be quite fun. When the false prophet gives life to the image of the beast and makes him speak, that's got to be ventriloquism, which they already <laughs> practiced back then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, e Egypt was um, good at that. They used to have um, the back of the temple. They had little holes for people to speak oh. around the back. So you wouldn't see who's speaking, but you would have these little holes at the back of the temple. So if you ask God a question, then God could answer. <laughs> um, and of course, the sound would reverberate around these stone oh, man. Um, rooms. <laughs> Priestcraft. Wow. Yeah. Boy, yes. oh boy. <laughs> wow. Uh, they weren't stupid, but we were. <laughs> well, it's a good way of controlling the population. You know, yeah. there's, there's only a few ways of controlling the population. One, one is by fear, by having an army. Um, mm. Another is by carrots i suppose by having a, a government with, that wants to bring you along and then you can do it via priests who uh, appeal to a higher authority and mm. say you must do this because otherwise god will be angry mm. and well, uh, yeah that's a surefire way of controlling a population mm. bread yeah, and services oh, i'm sorry we have to uh you have to you have, you're on and um seven minutes on your gnostic thing mm -hmm. like that so but that like that because we ran it it's almost two hours but we're doing pretty good mm -hmm. um yeah we it, it would be great if you would come back next weekend to, at, to answer more questions and mm -hmm. i'll set it up a little bit better and uh every time we have ralph on here it's like uh, like i'm related to ralph i mean just like <laughs> he's my uncle or something he's sitting right here i mean you know it's like uh mm -hmm. um I don't know. You just feel so comfortable. I mean, the guy is such a just comes across as such a nice guy. I mean, you know, yeah, who could? Yeah. You know, why would why would Jason Berman not like this guy? I mean, you got to be a you know. I mean, you got to be a real jagaloon not to like. I mean, this uh, guy. I mean, well, right, he, you know, he did ahead, like me to start with, but then suddenly things changed, and I think they changed for political or religious reasons. I think. Um, someone is pulling his strings uh, mm. and, and making his voice making his mouth move because i don't think this is what he really thinks himself hmm. i don't think i don't think so either but people would like if you come into the uh to into the uh the questions in the comments on your on the video today and answer questions could you do that 
Yeah, if it, once it's uh, up on uh, YouTube, yeah. It'll be there in a couple of minutes, but I'm going to have to get ready for the other show with uh, real quick so we can do his Gnostic presentation today because it's at 4 o'clock. Okay. And, uh, but that's any, that's but fine. That's lovely. Ralph, and I want to um, apologize again to you and everyone out there about the, the thing. I, uh, I'm a, a drug and alcohol counselor, and one of the guys who called in today really wanted to ask you a question. And, uh, you know, he's a good guy, and I work with him daily, every day. Really, really nice guy and uh, very intuitive, too. But he just, uh, we couldn't get our stuff together with that. But he, he wants oh, to be on it the It was next just one. going out live. That's all everyone could hear. Oh, I, know. I appreciate y'all <laughs> saying, you're saying something because uh, I was just trying to get him calmed down a little bit, and he, was, he had to go to, uh, He's a Catholic. He had to go to confessional. I know it's mm. kind of, you know, so, uh, but we'll end it now. And uh, everyone out there, much love and respect to you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ellis. I call you Dr. Even like that. And uh, or Professor Ellis and, and Dr. Price. I'll see you in two minutes. Okay, okay. you bet. Okay. Much love to everybody. And thank y'all so mm. much for tuning in. All of yep. our viewers Thanks, and subscribers, everybody. you're appreciated. Mm. Thank you. Mm.